Well, today I wanted to talk about exchanges and clearing houses, primarily stock exchanges. Uh, so w these are places where shares in corporations are traded. And I think uh, it's good to devote a whole session to them because uh, exchange is central to economics. I'm going to talk uh, mostly about uh, financial exchange. That's the subject of this course. And, but I, I can be a little bit more general. I wanted to start by distinguishing a broker and a dealer. What's the difference? Uh, it's a fundamental thing. A broker, uh, actually, I've got this almost as a slogan. A broker acts on behalf of others as an agent to earn a commission. So it's for others, trades for others as an agent for a commission. The commission is a fee. Um, what is a dealer? A dealer trades for himself or herself, uh, acting as a principal, not an agent, um, and profits from a markup. Okay, so uh, I can give you an example of each. When you buy or sell a house, do you get a real estate broker or a real estate dealer? <laughs> okay, that's almost obvious, right? Because you uh, you think you've heard the term real estate broker so many times. When you buy or sell a house, you commission a broker and you agree on a contract that pays the real estate broker a, s a certain sum of money, maybe six percent of the value of the house. Uh, if a uh, buyer is found. And then the broker doesn't buy your house, right? <laughs> uh, so the broker is an agent. And the 6% is the commission that the broker gets if he or she is successful in finding the other side uh, of, the, of the deal. Uh, what's an example of a dealer? An antique dealer. Right, suppose you're buying uh, a chest of drawers for your apartment. You go to an antique store, and there's someone there, your antique dealer, uh, who, uh, who has furniture that he now owns, having bought it, and then sells you the, um, and, and makes a profit by selling to you at a higher price, namely with a markup. He marks up the price that he paid for the uh, item. So we're going to talk about stock markets. And which do you think stock markets are? Are they, are they dealer markets or broker markets? <laughs> well, the answer is both. Uh, and now it's not as uh, clear. And I'll come back to this. Um, the New York Stock Exchange. New York Stock Exchange in New York is a broker market, or they would say an auction market. It's a continuous double auction market where a broker facilitates the uh, trades. The NASDAQ market is a dealer market. So. Uh, uh, you pay commissions to your broker at the New York Stock Exchange. You pay a markup to your dealer at NASDAQ. Jonathan's Coffee House. <laughs> I like that story. In London, uh, lots of people would get together and talk there, and coffee houses were uh, uh, became uh, Big thing in late 1600s, and somebody started posting stock prices on the wall, on a, 
at Jonathan's co Coffee House by, uh, what was the date? 1698. And so, the London Stock Exchange grew out of Jonathan's Coffee House. And then, uh, moving forward in time, now we're going to get lots of countries, but I'll mention the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, the uh, traders of shares in the United States uh, met outside, outside uh, and in 1792, under a buttonwood tree. <laughs> I'll put Buttonwood, that's a curious name. I think that's just a, a common uh, tree that we still have around. Uh, and they signed the agreement to form the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, but uh, then, uh, what else? Next in my little history, India, by the 1850s, there were in um, Mumbai, or then called Bombay, uh, there were traders under a famous banyan tree. <laughs> the same thing, they're all outdoors uh, in uh, Bombay. Bany these banyan trees are more <laughs> impressive than buttonwood trees. Uh, but by, it was by uh, 18, uh, uh, 1875, the Bombay Stock Exchange was founded. So that's the BSC. So that's been around for over a hundred years. But things have happened more recently. And one thing that's been shaking things up, these are very venerable old institutions. What's been shaking things up is the advent of electronic trading. Uh, and uh, these were kind of old fashioned, venerable institutions. Do you know what happens at the New York Stock Exchange? What happened then and still happens today? There's a floor called the trading floor, and the various brokers meet there, just like in Jonathan's Coffee House. They actually physically come to the floor and they stand around. And uh, there, are, there are posts for each stock. And if today you think you have a customer who wants to buy uh, IBM stock, then you go over to the IBM crowd, and there's a crowd of brokers there who are trading. And you just do it, <laughs> you verbally. You talk to them and you make a trade. Uh, that's really old-fashioned. There is something more electronic and modern about the New York Stock Exchange, but that specialist post behavior still persists. Most of the world is switching over to electronic trading. And so things happen that, um, so for example, in India, <coughs> they developed another stock exchange called the National Stock Exchange, uh, and that was uh, in 1992. And the National Stock Exchange was all electronic, uh, and so it was the modern version. It's rapidly gaining on the uh, Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, so uh, let me go a little bit more forward. Uh, China because of the communist government, did not have a stock exchange until 1990. And there were two found stock exchanges founded in China in 1990, Shanghai and Shenzhen. And at least the Shanghai Stock Exchange is owned by the Chinese government. And that's why Laura Cha, when she talked to us about that, she, she was on the Chi China Securities Regulatory Commission, which actually owned the Shanghai Stock Exchange. So, uh, th that's the, um, oh, Latin America. I'm just going to, Sao Paulo, Stock Exchange, 1890. Uh, Mexico has only one stock exchange, but it was founded in 1894. So we seem to have like two different kinds of exchange. We have the old exchanges that are at least 100 years old, and we have the new electronic exchanges. Uh, things have really sped up with the advent of electronic exchanges. So uh, I mentioned the New York Stock Exchange, which is started on the street uh, outdoors and is an old fashioned exchange that uh, has been slow to update. But more recently, we have 
I mentioned it already, NASDAQ. The, that's the, uh, it stands for originally National Association of Securities Dealers Automatic Quotation System, uh, which was created in the 1970s. Uh, the interesting story about NASDAQ uh, in, in the 70s, the New York Stock Exchange was highly prestigious. It was the, the big board, the, the, the place. Uh, and a, a critical element of a stock exchange is that in order to get your stocks traded on the exchange, you have to satisfy listing requirements. So the New York Stock Exchange would examine any corporation that wanted to be listed on the exchange, and it was the prestigious big exchange, so it had high standards. So the company had to have a history of earnings, it had to have uh, a, a, a the right kind of management structure and board. A lot of things were checked out by the exchange. And uh, as a result, the way it would work in, in the 1970s, a startup company could never get traded on the New York Stock Exchange. It would be traded instead by brokers off exchange or over the counter. So OTC uh, means over the counter, that means not on an exchange. Uh, so, in the 1970s and earlier, the uh, over-the-counter brokers uh, would deal with each other informally with telephone calls, or actually out on the street. <laughs> uh, they'd meet each other out on the sidewalk originally, and then they got telephones. Um, and they, they had some record which they called pink sheets, because uh, they were traditionally printed on pink paper. These were lists of dealers buy and sell uh, quotes on prices of over-the-counter stocks. The National Association of Securities Dealers then was an organization of these over-the-counter traders. And in the early 70s, they set up the first computerized system. Uh, they decided that everyone's telephoning everybody. Let's create a, a system that um, uh, that really works, and that gets us uh, gets us the information. Uh, and so that was the uh, NASDAQ system, uh, the first computer-based system, which has now increasingly taken over much of the world. I shouldn't imply that New York Stock Exchange was entirely a laggard on this. Um, Electronics played a role in stocks going back very early. The uh, New York Stock Exchange used telegraph in the 19th century to convey prices, and they invented ticker tape machines. A ticker tape machine is an electronic printer that would print out stock prices. Uh, and in fact, Thomas Edison, the inventor, his first invention was actually a ticker tape machine. Uh, that was in, the, I think, the 1870s that printed stock prices. But all it was was a record of what had traded recently. It wasn't a system that, uh, that helped you trade. It just reported what had happened. It was historical. So I wanted to show you what NASDAQ created uh, in the 70s. And uh, it's, it's a order book that would be visible to everyone who trades on it. Uh, so. Uh, Prior to discussing that, I want to tell you about different kinds of orders. Uh, if you buy and sell stock, and you call up a broker, and you say, I want to buy and sell, the simplest kind of order is a market order. And you would specify the quantity. You would say, I want to buy, a, and, the, and the name of the company, of course, I want to buy 100 shares of General Motors, or I want to sell 100 shares. But you don't name a price. You, you, you'll find out whatever the price was. The broker will get you the best price. Uh, will try, if, he's, if he or she is a good broker, will try to get you the best price. But uh, it'll still be uh, unknown to you, because you didn't specify it. 
you might be unhappy with the price. The price might be too high, okay? And then the broker will say to you, well, you know, if you're unhappy, you should have told me. Uh, you could have told me not to pay more than a certain amount for a buy, or not to take less than a certain amount for a sell. So th the alternative is a limit order. And so with a limit order, you give both quantity and price. So uh, if it's a buy, I want to buy so many shares, but I don't want to pay more than such and such a price. Then the, uh, the broker will keep that on his, uh, on his or her books until, uh, well, whatever the agreement between you and the broker is. It might expire after the day is over, or you could ask to have it kept on the book. And when the price becomes available, that's under, uh, that, which is no higher than your, than your specified price, then the order will be executed. Otherwise, it won't be executed. And then for a sell order, it would be the same thing. You, know, the, the, if you specify both a quantity and a price, and the order will be filled, or partly filled. You might not be able to get all of your quantity, but they'll fill as much as they can of it at a price, at that price or lower. Uh, and there's another kind of order called a stop order. Uh, <coughs> with a stop order, you also specify quantity and price. <coughs> but it's different. With a limit order, uh, you, you would you would, if you would buy, it, it say it's a buy limit order. Well, let's talk about sell. If it's, a, if it's a sell limit order, you would sell the quantity at such and such a price or higher. With a stop order, you would sell that quantity at such and such a price or lower. Let's make that clear. A stop order, also called a stop loss order, is an order that you can place with the broker to indicate that. I'm worried that this stock might really collapse, and I don't want, I'm holding it, you know, but I want you to sell it if the price starts falling a lot. So, uh, so suppose the price is 100 today, I could put a stop loss order at 80. And then at least I know I can't lose more than 20% of my investment because the broker will immediately sell it when the price of that stock falls below 80. There's also a buy stop order. And that would be something that someone would rationally do if that person had shorted a stock. So if you had shorted a stock and you were worried that the price would go up and ruin you, you can leave with your broker a buy stop order to sell it, I mean to buy the stock whenever the price exceeds a certain amount. And you would do that to prevent yourself from having unlimited losses on your short position. So those are the, there's other kinds of orders, but those are the main kinds of orders. So uh, now I wanted to specif talk particularly about limit orders. That's the most important kind. Uh, a lot of uh, advisors say never place a market order. Why should you ever do a market order? <laughs> There's always some you know price that you'd be unhappy with. You might as well say that. Uh, and so some exchanges don't even allow market orders. They uh, uh, so let's talk about limit orders. And what I wanted to show you. Uh, was what a uh, NASDAQ level two customer sees. Uh, NASDAQ is an organization, now it's, it's a firm traded on its own stock exchange, or it's called NASDAQ OMX. But if you want to subscribe to NASDAQ, it's very expensive, I understand. So you can subscribe at level one uh, or level two, which is more expensive. I'm I was going to show you an example of what you would see on your computer screen if you subscribe to NASDAQ Level 2 for a particular stock. And so uh, this is a hypothetical limit order book for uh, Microsoft. Uh, what it shows, uh, 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 this would be. This is not live, but it would be live on your screen. And you, these numbers would be changing before your eyes, flashing back and forth before your eyes. Uh, and so I've just frozen it at a moment of time. 
So what do we have? We have six columns here. This, is, this first column is the shares uh, that people want to buy. So the first three columns correspond to those. So the, the up, uh, bid is the price they're bidding to buy these shares. Okay. Remember, NASDAQ is a dealer market. So these are dealers are making these bids, or people are making them through a dealer. And uh, MPID is the marketplace ID, where these bids and uh, uh, offers are being made. So uh, the first one shown, someone is offering to buy a hundred dollars, a hundred shares of Microsoft at a price of $25.23. And that is listed on ARCA-X. Uh, ARCA-X, there's an interesting, so I didn't mention that exchange. It's now part of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, maybe I'll come back to that in a minute, but let me just ex continue to explain this, um, this uh, slide. Now, you note that the bid prices are arranged in declining order, right? They go down as you move down. The computer has sorted all the orders. These, these are all the unfilled orders. Someone called their broker and said, I want to buy 100 shares. And the broker uh, entered the uh, bid through ARCAX, ARCAX uh, and it's now on the NASDAQ screen. Uh, someone else had a much bigger buy order, wants to buy 9,430 shares. Uh, and this came in directly to NASDAQ, and, but it's a penny less, $25.22. And so you can just see what's going down. Now, the other side of this, do you, is that clear what we're seeing here? The other side of the screen is the buy orders, and it's exactly the same, except that here the, the numbers go up as you move down the screen, because the, the, the computer has sorted them in the reverse order. So that represents what various people are willing to buy. Uh, so somebody is willing to buy 2,400 shares at $25.24, OK? And uh, somebody, uh, well, actually, there's two different customers. I th this one placed the order first, so I think it, that's the priority. It's by the one who placed it first. Somebody else at the Cincinnati Exchange, I guess that's what that means, or offered to buy 8,200 shares at the very same price. Uh, but it's listed as a separate order, and so on. So now you're sitting here looking at the screen now, and you notice that this ask price here is higher than the bid price there. So what does that mean to you? Um, it, uh, it means there's no trade, right? <laughs> because Somebody wants, someone is offering to sell at $25.24, and somebody's offering to buy at $25.23. It's no trade until somebody changes their price. Now, that's no surprise because these orders would be filled very quickly if there's a crossing. See, these two lines don't cross. So it's, it's like if you plotted these curves, there's supply and demand curves, right? We could plot the amount. Uh, at various prices. Uh, well, I, you can see I'd have curves that, that, a supply and demand curve that don't cross. Normally, we have a, they have to cross somewhere, and then there's a market clearing price. These, cars, these things normally don't cross, because if they did cross, it would immediately disappear from the screen. Someone would finish the order and then sell. But you sitting at the screen uh, uh, now have a pretty good idea what the price is. Uh, a NASDAQ level two is better than NASDAQ level one because level one just gives you the first row. All right, it's cheaper to subscribe to that. What NASDAQ level one gives you is the inside spread. It would tell you that there is 100 shares trade, uh, bid at $25.23 and asked at $25.24. And if you want to hit that order, you could take either side of that. But it doesn't tell you the whole picture. Uh, if you know NASDAQ level two, you know a lot more about the market. And if you're going to play the game of trading, you want to know this. 
So for example, you know that it might be hard for a price to fall rapidly before below $25.22 because there's a big buyer down there. And so it's going to be hard for the price to fall below that. Uh, so if you saw the screen in real life, these numbers would be just blinking, changing rapidly before you. And uh, uh, trades that were there 20 seconds ago would be gone uh, in, a, in a flash. So you've got to move fast to execute these trades. Uh, on a fully automated system, the uh, trades would be executed automatically. And this is becoming, electronic trading is taking over the world. And the, uh, the orders can be executed by computers that make it instant so that you don't even, the number doesn't even appear on the screen long enough for you to see it. Um, so one development that's coming in now is what's called high frequency trading. Uh, HFT, uh, which is uh, trading that is done by computers. Once you have a system like this, it's when, you, when you have to trade through a floor broker on the New York Stock Exchange, it, it has to proceed at human pace, right? The way it works is you make a telephone call to your broker. Your broker makes another telephone call to the representative on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That person walks over to the crowd. <laughs> And then discusses and you know, indicates the, what it's like a poker game. You know, you you, you don't want to reveal your hand, but you kind of feel people out. And then after a little discussion, you reach a a, a, a trade. Uh, but when you have something that you can hit on a computer, it just goes instantly. So people start programming trading, and that that that's been a important phenomenon because uh, you know you see these things moving faster than you can. These prices disappear and reappear so fast that um, you can't quite uh, know, you can't act fast enough. So we have algorithmic trading um, or um, program trading. And so that uh, goes back to uh, practically to the 1970s, certainly by the uh, 80s. Program trading was becoming a big and important um, phenomenon, and it's becoming increasingly important now. Uh, high frequency trading now, uh, brokers will in, in invoke what, what are called millisecond strategies. You can actually flash uh, an order on some of the exchanges that lasts a thousandth of a second. You can put a buy order <laughs> or a sell order and retract it in, in a millisecond. And that means you're, this would be a trading strategy which you might employ. You could do that to discourage people from trading. If you want to trade only with the computers, if you think, I want to, uh, I, I, people are too smart for me, I don't want to trade with people, I want to rip off the computers, then you write a millisecond trading strategy and then you, 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 can, you can sort into who, who, uh, who trades with you. Uh, uh, not, now, the interesting thing about millisecond trading is that it's favoring the electronic exchanges. More and more, as time goes on, people are getting more and more sophisticated about, about uh, high frequency trading. And so they want to trade on exchanges that are fully electronic so that they can play all of these games. And that means that the floor exchanges are dying out over most of the world. Um, by the way, the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I was going to give you a history of it. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange has been slow to adapt to these technologies. Let me just give you a little history of electronic trading uh, is an exciting thing for uh, many people. Uh, but I think it started, or the, the really um, interesting electronic trading started with the ECNs, Electronic Com Communication Networks that were allowed by the Securities and Exchange Commission as alternatives to stock exchanges. Stock exchanges are highly regulated by governments around the world. But in the 1990s, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission allowed more 
uh, sophisticated electronic trading, at least as an experiment. So they didn't call these uh, things exchanges, they called them ECNs. And one of the most important ECNs was a company called Archipelago. Another one was called Island. And these were actually just websites where you could trade. And they were open <coughs> to the public. They, were, they, they had a different culture. They had more of a web culture. The web culture is, we're not going to charge you to see the o o order book. We'll just put it out to everybody. Right? The web doesn't charge you for a lot of things. Uh, and so they became popular trading sites for the general public. They grew up the way the personal computer grew. So New York Stock Exchange, when they first saw Archipelago, they said, oh, this is a bunch of college kids fooling around, some computer game, sort of. Uh, and they didn't take it seriously. But eventually, the New York Stock Exchange had to take it seriously because Archipelago was growing so fast. So eventually, New York Stock Exchange merged with Archipelago. Uh, and so, uh, uh, they're now, uh, I think most of their trades go through ARCA-X. I'm not sure if that's right, but a large fraction of their trades go through ARCA-X. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the, um, so yeah, New York Stock Exchange brought Ar bought Archipelago in 2005. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, Ar Ar Arca X was breathing close on uh, New York Stock Exchange for trading volume. Uh, things are happening fast in the stock exchange because the technology is changing. Whereas we had the New York Stock Exchange in the old days, it was this single prestigious exchange that lasted for over 150 years without any substantive change. But now electronic trading is coming in. And everything is being shaken up. 